The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, do you ever wish that God would show up? And I don't mean, you know, behind the scenes, God works in mysterious ways. But do you ever wish that God would make himself so blatantly obvious that he would just do this crazy, unexpected miracle? What if you knew that next week that God was going to do that at church? That God was going to bring someone back to life or God was going to turn that couple of crumbs of popcorn under your seat into buckets so that everyone could be fed. You know, you'd show up and you wouldn't just show up. You'd bring all of your mates as well. The 8.30, 10.30, they'd both sell out. The live stream would go viral. You know, the Christian life, we, we often feel distant from God. We ask ourselves questions. Is, is God really there? And is he really good? Perhaps for some of us that have more recently become Christian, we might be beginning to think that our life before we were followers of Jesus, it it sort of looks appealing. It looks a bit better. You know, maybe the things that we used to do were fun that we've cut out of our lives. Maybe there have been people that we've lost friendships and we reminisce about the good times we had with them. For others who have been Christians for a while, sometimes we look at others and we think, why can't I have that? We look at others with their their homes, their jobs, their families, and we think, why hasn't God given me that? Those people, they look like they have it all. Maybe you're someone here this morning who is not a Christian and has been coming along maybe for a few weeks, months, maybe today's your first time. So glad you're here. We hope you feel welcome. But perhaps you're asking this question as well. Is God real? Is he really here? This question, is God with us? It's not a new question. In fact, it's a question that was asked uh, three and a half thousand years ago by the Israelites, as we see in Exodus. If you have a Bible, open up to Exodus chapter 17. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love to give you one. Chat to our team at the info desk. Uh, the, the section we'll be looking at this morning, uh, Exodus 15, 22 to 17, 7, slightly longer than what was just read on the video. But we're going to see some incredible, miraculous events. And despite all of that, God's people ask, come with me to chapter 17, verse 7. They ask this question, is the Lord among us or not? It's a great question. See, if God is really with us now, then what we do here matters. Our life matters. Our relationships matter. How we represent Him as the people of God at church, it, it all matters. And But if actually, if whatever's thrown at us, the ups and downs of life. God has a plan because he's with us. But if God isn't really with us, then actually it doesn't really matter. We're free then to live however we want. Uh, Christianity just becomes a crutch to lean on for support. It has no real power. So is God really with us? As we just kind of set up where we've been in Exodus, if you've been with us so far, um, chapter 15, verse 22, come with me uh, to read that verse. Then it says, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went into the wilderness and found no water. So God's people, they've been uh, under oppression for 400 years in slavery, uh, in basically slave labor camps. And uh, under Pharaoh, it escalated so that he was killing the baby boys. It was really a horrible, horrible time. And yet God heard his cry, heard the cry of his people. And uh, like a loving father, he said, I will rescue, I will redeem my people. And over the last few weeks, we've seen this conquest between Egypt and Israel, which is really a conquest between Pharaoh and God. And we've seen God's mighty hand deliver his people. Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let his people go to let God's people go, Israel go. And so nine times there were escalating plagues after Pharaoh's heart was hard and he said no to letting God's people go. Until finally, uh, the, the most intense, severe plague of them all we saw, which the Passover, where all the firstborn of Egypt were, were killed. God's judgment over Egypt. And so Israel escapes and then Pharaoh again, he changes his, so finally Israel goes and Pharaoh changes his mind again and he lets his people, lets God's people go, but then he changes his mind and chases them and they get to the Red Sea and then like, what do we do? We're stuck. And God said to Moses, raise your, raise your staff, your stick and the Red Sea will be parted and God's people walk through it. And then Israel with their armies, with their chariots are chasing them. They get stuck in their chariot wheels, get clogged up uh, in the sand 
land, and then the, the water closes in, the wall of water closes in over them. Uh, they are swept away. God's people are saved. They burst out into a praise song. And I love this in uh, 1518, that the Lord will reign forever. God's people are free. They're safe. They're on their way to the promised land. Things should be good, right? And yet, 1522, what happens? Uh, they went through three days through the wilderness and found no water. Here, there's a problem. They're in the desert, three days, no water. If you've been for a hike in summer in Brisbane, the first thing you need to take is water. Let's keep reading. Verse 23, what happens? Well, when they, they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah, which means bitter. Good news, they find some water, but they can't drink it. I'm not exactly sure why bitter. Maybe there were animals that had died in it. Maybe it was salty, uh, like seawater. Maybe it just tastes really bad. We're not exactly sure, but it's not drinkable. And so what do people do? Well, keep reading. Verse 24. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? They grumble. They grumble again to God. Haven't they seen what God can do with water? Uh, he's just part of the Red Sea. He's closed it back. Uh, back, in, um, back earlier in Exodus, we saw that God changed the river Nile into blood and then back to water. Even Moses was saved out of water. His name means I was, I was drawn out of water. And, and later on in chapter 17, they'll again grumble, complain for there being no water. And in chapter 16, some of it was read uh, in the video, there's no food. And so they're asking the question, is God with us or not? And so for us, as we consider this question, we're going to see three ways in which God is with his people back then and today. Firstly, God tests through trials. God tests through trials. There are very real trials in life, aren't they? Obviously, the pandemic, COVID, has affected us all and continues to affect us all in lots of different ways. But even beyond that, there's sickness and suffering, depression, anxiety, infertility, loss of job. I could keep going on and on and on. There's lots of trials in life. Where is God in the midst of these trials? For Israel, they were promised the promised land, and a land flowing with milk and honey, and yet they were in a desert. And so come with me again, 1522. Uh, then Moses made Israel set, set out from the Red Sea, and they were in the wilderness of Shur. There were three days in the wilderness and found no water. And then again, 17 verse 1. All the congregation of the people moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages. According to the commandment of the Lord, they camped by Rephidim, but there was no water for people to drink. There's no water. 16, there's no food. A pretty basic human problem. Why would God deprive his people of food and water well he's testing them through the trials come back with me to chapter 15 25 so we're flicking around a little bit um all the verses might not appear on the screen but i encourage you bring your bibles um if you own one um because it helps you see sort of the bigger picture context and flicking all that stuff 15 25 um, and they cried to and he cried to the lord moses cried to the lord and the lord showed him a log and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Then the Lord made for them a rule and a statue there. He tested them. See, God, he's testing his people. What's the test? Keep reading, verse 26, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statues, I'll put none of those diseases I put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord your healer. God is saying to his people, trust me, I'm your healer. You saw what it was like for the Egyptians. Remember those big boils they had on their face? It's kind of got a little pimple up here, like that's bad enough. I would not want boils. I don't want my face to look like that. God, he's good. He's a healer. Uh, he doesn't want to judge his people. Uh, he wants them to be walking humbly with them. And so what happens? Verse 27, uh, he hears their cry. Um, and then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by water. Things are good. They've got water. They find this oasis in the desert, springs of water and palm trees. Things go well, but as we read on, chapter 16, 
They set out from Elam, and all the congregation and the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So they didn't stay in the oasis for very long. 15th day, second month, it's only about six weeks since they've left Egypt. And what happens? They, they complain to Moses. They grumble. And so the Lord says, verse 4, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven before you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion uh, every day that I might test them whether they will walk in my law or not. See, God, he's going to make, he's going to make a miracle happen. It's going to be cloudy with a chance of chicken burgers. You know, if you're with us week one, I said there'd be chicken burgers. Uh, here they are. God, he, you know, I remember hearing a youth, a youth talk, God, he makes it grain. And, and that the youth pastor threw out kind of bread rolls into the audience there. Uh, I won't do that. It's not COVID safe to do that anymore. Steve Koo will get me in trouble. But God, uh, he makes it rain bread, manna and heaven. That's like the gourmet version of bread and chicken kind of miraculously given by God. But why? Well, he provides for them, but also so that he may test his people. I don't know if you saw that. It's not a test to, to catch them out. It's not like that surprise maths quiz you had in year 10. No. God, he desires a relationship with his people. He wants them to walk with him in his law. God's made his people. He's made us. He knows what's best for us. And so he wants us to walk obediently with him. He's the loving father who wants his kids to listen to him so that they can flourish as the people of God in this promised land. That's the goal. That's where they're heading. And so what's this test? Well, it's to follow his commandments and his laws. And that's actually a big theme, not just through Exodus, but throughout the whole Old Testament. And in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to see the, the famous, the Ten Commandments, the most important commandments given in Exodus. And the big question uh, that the Old Testament is asking is, can God's people live up to God's law? Can God's people follow His law? And the question emerges as we see that time and time again, they'll continually stuff up. The question sort of shifts a little bit to who can keep God's law? Is there anyone worthy to, to obediently walk with God? And so this particular test uh, in chapter 16, where they're hungry, you know, their, their, their stomachs are grumbling, uh, and so they grumble towards God. This particular test, we can you know, call it the hung, hunger games, if you like. Um, God says, yep, I'll give you food, but I'm not just this you know, vending machine that's just going to give out food willy-nilly. No, I want you to know me, and I want you to be like me. And so see verse 6, God says, so, oh, sorry, verse 6 says, so, so Moses and, and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And God, he provides food for his people, but on two conditions. In verse 19, he says, Let no one leave any of it to the morning, so make sure you get it all. Uh, don't leave any food behind. Pick up all the chicken burgers. Um, but how do they go? What happens? Well, verse 20, we see, but they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank. And Moses, kind of acting on behalf of God, he was angry with them. They failed the first test. He said, one thing, one thing, Israel. Secondly, secondly, what do they have to do? Well, uh, verse 26, six days you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. So the Sabbath, which was Saturday, um, the day of rest, God uh, is rested as he, he made the world. Six days he made the world. The seventh day he rested. God says, I want you to rest. I rest. I want you to rest. I want you to be like me. Um, how do they go? They weren't meant to go out to the field and get more bread. They're meant to just trust in what God had provided for them. Well, keep reading verse 27. On the seventh day, some of them went out together, but they found none. And the Lord, he steps in this time. He said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? They fail the test again. But actually, these little tests are sort of part of a bigger test we see in Exodus and in Numbers as well of God's people in the wilderness. So geographically, they should have only been there a few weeks. It wasn't you know, back then they didn't have cars and roads and infrastructure, all that stuff. It, it didn't, it shouldn't, even back then, it shouldn't have even taken that long to get 
to Egypt, to Israel. It wasn't a 40-year journey, but God kept them in the wilderness because of their sin, because they kept failing these tests. They kept saying, no, no, I won't trust you. I'm going to walk my own way away from the goodness and the promise and the provisions of God. God, he wants people to be in a relationship with him. He's not forcing them to, but he desires obedience to people to be humbly walking with him. So Israel, they had their security stripped away from them, though. You know, things were bad in Egypt, but at least there was consistency. At least there was a pattern. But here, they, apart from God, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And they don't know how long they're going to be on this journey for. They start to doubt God's goodness. And for us today, maybe that's you as well. Maybe you're asking, where is God in the midst of my wilderness? You know, we cry out to God asking for prayer, but He's silent. We want instant gratification, right? We want results yesterday. Like the Israel, like Israel were in a wilderness for 40 years, we too are in a spiritual wilderness. We have been saved from our sin and we're on our way to the promised land, which is heaven, to be with His people and God forever. But now we're in this state called the now but not yet. Uh, we've been saved. We've been saved from our sin. We're, we're with Jesus spiritually and yet we're not there in heaven. Uh, we're in this now but not yet. It's sort of like, who's seen, I reckon it's one of the greatest movies ever, who's seen Shawshank Redemption? A bunch of you, maybe half of you. Uh, well, this won't spot too much. And if it does, sorry, it's like 28 years old. So you've had your chance to watch it. But it's kind of like when Andy DeFrance is in the tunnel. He's crawling out from somewhere and he's going to freedom. I won't spoil it more than that if you haven't seen it, but it'll make sense when you get to there. But it's like being in that move, it's like being in that tunnel. If you've seen it, the tunnel, it's not, it's not a pleasant experience, right? What he's crawling through. It's not fun. Life can be like that. We're on our way to freedom freedom with God. We've been saved from bondage, and yet we're in this tunnel, uh, uncertainty, where there's just junk everywhere. There's trials. You know, maybe since, you've be- maybe since you've become a Christian, maybe your circumstances actually have not gotten better. Maybe they've even gotten worse. Uh, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've lost a friend. You've uh, lost a family member. Maybe you're experiencing sickness or yourself. God actually doesn't promise a life of health and wealth here and now. He does in eternity in heaven, but here and now, He actually doesn't promise that. What He does promise is a life of trials and testing. You know, maybe when you think of a test, you sort of think of like a COVID test. You know, who's had a COVID test in the last couple of years? Yeah, a good chunk of us. You know, the Christian life, it's not a spiritual swab test to see if you're worthy, to see if it's a yes or no, whether you can come in. No, no. Check out what these verses in 1 Peter say in the New Testament. This is the gospel. This is the Christian message that according to God's great mercy, God has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we've been saved into an inheritance that will be revealed, that's kept, uh, that's safe, that can't be spoiled because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is what Christians believe. But it comes with trials. If you keep reading uh, that letter in 1 Peter, it says, In this, uh, in response to this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. It's a little while because in the context of eternity, you're, 80, you're 100 years on earth. It's, it's pretty small compared to infinity. You can do the maths uh, on that one. But for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through it, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The test isn't, are you good enough to get in? No, no, that's already been accomplished by Jesus. But God is testing our faith. He's refining our faith, making us more and more like Jesus, patiently working behind the scenes um, so that Jesus gets the praise and glory and honor. Trials are an opportunity to trust in God's goodness in His character, rather than our, our emotions. To trust in His eternal plan, rather than our 
experiences. And looking to Jesus, we see someone who understands trials, who's gone to the cross, who was spat on, who was shamed, who was tortured, beaten, hung up, executed, had his mates bail on him to face the judgment of the world that you and I deserve. We can look to Jesus as one who was tested. So where's God? He's testing in the trials. But secondly, I'll move a bit quicker now. God is gracious in the grumbling. God graciously gives in the grumbling. See, God, despite having his people whinge and moan and complain, he continuously provides for them. Three times in this section, we see Israel grumbling, not getting what they want on their terms. In 1524, they grumble because the water's bitter. So what does God do? He, verse 25, the Lord showed him a log and he threw it into water and the water becomes sweet. In response to them complaining about the bitter water, he makes it sweet and drinkable. The grumbling continues to get worse. In chapter 16, verse 2, Um, And this whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would it that we have died by the hand of the Lord uh, in the land of Egypt when we sat by and ate the meat pots and bread to the full? For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Their belly is rumbling, so they start grumbling. You know, they think about the meat and the bread that they used to have back in Egypt. You know, they were thinking that Egypt's better. It's only been six weeks. Don't you remember what it was like? You were being whipped and tortured. Your babies were being killed. They doubt God's goodness, despite the fact that he's shown up, that he's provided for them already, that he's rescued them, that he's saved them. They forget about the promises of God. And even worse, they accuse God of trying to kill them. How does God respond? Slap in the face like that. How should he respond? Well, in his justice, uh, he has every right to just wipe them out there and then on the spot. But what does he do? Come with me to verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. He graciously listens to their grumbling and gives them what they're asking for, meat and bread. And so in verse 13, it says, In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flat-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? But they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to him, It's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. See, in the middle of the desert... God miraculously provides for his people. And it's a good feed. Uh, The bread, it it tastes like wafers made with honey. It's like a dessert in the desert. It's this sweet deal for them. Excuse the pun. And everyone, they've had enough to eat. Uh, And for the next 40 years, actually, as we read on in Exodus and in Numbers, God continuously continues to provide food for them. And in chapter 17, even more grumbling. Even more grumbling. Come with me, 17.1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. Moses, he's at his wit's end. People are about to kill him. How will God respond? Well, verse 5 God says, And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on to the people, before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, take in your hand the staff which you used to strike the Nile, and go. Before I will stand there before you um, on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and people will drink. Once again, God responds graciously to the grumbling, and people have water to drink. You might be thinking, aren't what people are asking, pretty basic. Like you might be thinking, I've never prayed that God would give me food and water. Like those things are a given, right? 
this is a pretty basic human need. So the issue isn't with what they're asking. The issue is actually their heart attitude behind what they're asking. How do we know that? Like, how do I know that what I'm saying is true? Well, how do we interpret any part of the Bible? The, the best, you know the best book of, to interpret the Bible is? The best commentary of the Bible? Here's a secret. It's the Bible. The Bible is the best way to understand the Bible. The different books of the Bible uh, can interpret us and, and give clarity to what God is doing. And in Hebrews uh, 3, Hebrews actually picks up heaps of this language in Exodus. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 uh, the writer of Hebrews, he's, he's actually quoting Psalm 95, which is referring to this passage. And, and he says that if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts uh, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. He's writing to Christians and it's post Jesus. He's saying, Christians, don't be like Israel in the wilderness. It was rebellion. He's actually changed the name. In Psalm 95, it says Massa, Meribah. He's changed the name of that to rebellion. Don't be like the Israel in the rebellion. They had grumbling hearts. They were hardened. And they had this attitude of sin and rebellion towards God. And eventually, how did God respond? We're only six weeks into this 40-year journey. But eventually, God responds with His justice. Uh, we see in uh, Hebrews 3 verse 10, Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they will always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways, and I've swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So the rebellion, it kept on going, and, uh, and eventually God says, you, you can't enter into the promised land. A whole generation, um, people 20 years and up, could not enter into the promised land. God's justice, it prevailed after people kept drifting away and trying to trust in themselves instead of the goodness of God. If you're a Christian today, it means you have been rescued from the slavery of sin. It means we are on our way to the promised land, a life of freedom, purpose with God, and yet we grumble. If we're honest with ourselves, we're grumblers. We're no better than Israel. We have hard hearts. We get jealous of what others have. We complain about what God has given us. We're tempted to think that life without God is better. When things go well for us, how quickly are we to take the credit? And when things don't go well, how quickly are we to, to shift the blame? And so often we do that to God. God, He hates that. He's angry at our hearts, at our rebellion, at our grumbling. And yet, God continually offers us grace. We stuff up time and time again. God promises to never leave us or forsake us. He's given us, Ephesians 1 says, He's given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. He's given us His Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is dwelling with us if we trust in Jesus. And He's given us the church as, as family, as brothers and sisters. And so we ask this question, where is God? Why don't He just show up? You know, if God, that's a dangerous question to ask. If, if God were to, to show up in the face of our sin, it wouldn't go well with us. God has every right to judge us, to punish us, to hold us accountable here and now for our sin. But instead, He's patiently, graciously waiting for us to repent, to turn back to Him, to walk with Him. He continually gives us grace. But friends, we, there's a warning here as well. We can't just say, unlimited grace, therefore I can do what I want. No, we shouldn't presume upon God's grace. There's a warning uh, in Hebrews that those with hard hearts may drift away. They may not, like Israel didn't enter the promised land, Christians, people who are calling themselves Christians, may not actually make it to heaven. Not because they're not good enough, no one's good enough, but because of their hardness of heart, their deceitfulness of sin. He, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort each other, one another, one another every day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If you've been around church for a little while, I'm sure you've seen people that call themselves followers of Jesus, maybe even leaders that are no longer trusting in Jesus. Through the hardness of heart, the deceitfulness of sin have drifted away from the fold of God. Friends, that warning is real and it's for you. Keep, what do we do? Well, we exhort each other. We encourage each other. 
God's graciously given us each other a community so that that we can keep helping each other trust in Jesus. Friends, do you do you know do people know you well enough to know that you might be drifting? Uh, as we do community with each other, gospel communities, as we as we fellowship, as we hang out with each other, do people here do they know what's going on behind the mask? Do they know what's going on in your heart? Do you have people in your life that you're open and honest and able to pray with, pray for? Is there someone in your life, is there someone in this church who you know and love that you see might be drifting? Are you, are you praying for them? Uh, in love, in humility, what would it look like for you to have a hard conversation with them, to encourage them to keep coming back to Jesus and His goodness and yet remind them that they are in danger of sin, that, they, that sin can drift, take people away from the goodness of God? Is God with us? What's He doing with us now? Well, we've seen He, he tests us in the trials. He graciously gives us um, more in the grumbling. And finally, His quickest point, so finally, the quick, quickest point, God feeds us forever. I'll wrap up with this. So for Israel, God provided for 40 years for them with manna, with bread. They were sustained in the desert. What about us? Where's, where's God now? All that miraculous stuff that was back in the past, you know, that's pretty old school. What about now? Well, if we look to Jesus, we see actually that we have a better Moses. If you turn with me to John, uh, grab your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, before Acts. Jesus, he, he's miraculously fed, like Moses, he's miraculously fed 5,000 people in the wilderness. Again, with, um, with meat and bread, uh, this time uh, the meat wasn't quail, but it was fish. Some of you are thinking, fish isn't meat. I'm a vegetarian. I eat fish. No, no, if you're a vegetarian, you don't eat fish because it's, you're not a vegetarian, right? You've got to pick one. You can't be both. You, know, you can be a vegetarian, maybe. I'll give you that, but not a vegetarian. Anyway, back to the Bible. Um, chapter, chapter, John chapter 6, verse 27. What did Jesus say after he's fed them? He says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him, God the Father has set His seal. You know, you work, you have jobs to put food on the table. You keep doing that day in, day out, but food, it spoils, it perishes. You know, the milk that you've got in your fridge right now, either you'll drink it or someone else drink it or it'll go to waste. You know, milk doesn't last forever. Jesus is saying, lift up your gaze, look beyond the food that will spoil, that will perish, look to eternity, look for something greater. Look for the food that will be able to sustain you for eternal life. And so they ask, verse 28, what must we be doing um, to be doing the works of God? What do we have to do? How do we get this food that lasts forever? Well, Jesus says in verse 29, he says, this is the work of God. This is what you have to do. This is how you get to heaven. He says, you need to believe in him who was sent. Believe in Jesus. That's how you get eternal life. That's it. That's the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus has done the work for us. Jesus has paid the way so that we can have eternal bread, eternal milk, eternal honey, eternal food for, with, with God and all his people in heaven forever. And so look at how Jesus reflects back on the wilderness and in Israel. Back in 31, he says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it was written, he gave them bread to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. What did Jesus say? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The miracle of God providing food in in the wilderness and the miracle of Jesus providing food in the wilderness for people, that actually points towards something even better, something even greater. That actually through Jesus, we can have the bread of life. Through Him, we can be sustained, not just for this life, but for eternity. Eternal peace, eternal feasting with God and His people. As I invite the band up, let me ask you again this question. Where is God? Is He really with us? Brothers and sisters, like Israel, we we experience hardships. The Christian life, it's a wilderness as we make our way towards the promised land. We've been saved from sin, 
with purpose, to eternal purposes of life with God. Yet God is there. He's here with us. He's testing us through the trials. Even though we grumble at what God has graciously given us, He feeds us, not just now, but forever. And so we've got an opportunity now to respond. I'm going to pray and we're going to, we're going to sing. We're going to sing uh, and be reminded of, of how God is providing for our needs. And also as well, I'd like to invite you to, to pray. Myself and a couple of others uh, will be just in the middle there. We see us with lanyards on. We'd love to, to pray with you. Uh, maybe there's things going on in the wilderness of your life uh, that perhaps they have been brought up this morning. Uh, there, there's some suffering, there's some sickness, whatever it is, we'd love to be praying for you. Maybe you just want some encouragement, someone to talk to. We'd love to be there for you as well. Let me pray for all of us now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are with us, even when we don't feel it. Thank you that through our trials, you have a plan and are refining us. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to experience the trial that we all deserve on the cross by paying for our sin. And thank you that despite our grumbling, you continue to offer us more grace. And thank you that in Jesus, you're feeding us now and forever. And all of God's people said, 